the greatest impressionist of the black and white. These are the words of George Bernard Shaw about Felix Topolsky, the man whose notes from all over the world cannot be equaled for the power of their expression, their faithfulness, and the depth of the message conveyed. Chronicles, the unique bi-weekly created by the artist for 2,000 subscribers from all over the world for two years. He noted down thousands of cultural and political events and created profiles of hundreds of individuals who shaped our times and values of the communities they lived in. Rysunek nie jest traktowany poważnie przez pisma. Także stworzyłem to moje własne pismo, które po prostu zawierało wybór najlepszych moich pisów. Kroniki, w tym sensie, że to są, tego jest, już nie pamiętam, z 15 tomów, a każdy tom zawiera dwadzieścia kilka arkuszy. Także to nie musi być pokazywane starannie, tylko raczej pokazane jako kupa i z tej kupy mogą się wyłaniać różne rzeczy. After the war, Felix Topolsky made friends with Lieutenant Colonel Czesław Bednarczyk, an officer in General Anders' army, and his wife Krystyna. In London in 1950, the Bednarczyks opened the first Polish emigre printing house, the basis of the later The Printing House of the Poets and Painters, whose role in the history of the Polish post-war culture and art cannot be overestimated. From 1953, together with Bednarczyk, Felix Topolsky began to publish the Topolsky Chronicles, which appeared in 24 notebooks yearly until 1968. The Printing House published the Chronicles until 1957. Then they were published by Charles and Reed Limited, Capt Limited, and St. Clements. Today, Kristina Bednarczyk, Czesław's widow, doesn't want to talk about Felix Topolsky. Carol, Felix's widow, his second wife, doesn't want to talk either. Daniel Topolsky, Felix's son, writes about the Chronicles. It is the diary of his life. It contains more than 3,000 graphics on various topics, from the theater to politics, from war to ports, from rock and roll to the Mao Cultural Revolution. They show events connected with the traditions of a given country, African and Asiatic customs, but their greatest value lies in how wonderfully they present people. Portraits made by Felix Topolsky disclose the truth hidden behind the facade, enabling the viewers to understand the character and personality of the person portrayed. What is most important, continued Daniel, is that he immortalized the characteristic key personalities who influenced the history of the 20th century. With great compassion, honesty, understanding and also humor, he portrayed more than 1,000 individuals of the previous century. With a few touches of his hand, he depicted not only a person, but also one's character. Here you have Picasso, Kennedy, Churchill, Mao, Bob Dylan, Gloria Swanson. How warm is Gandhi's face? How superior and different Khrushchev looks? Professor Jakub Bronowski characterizes Topolsky's technique in this way. We can see that Topolsky's graphics do not just show a face but examine it. The artist observes it and recognizes detail as if through a touch. Therefore, each line added strengthens a picture, yet doesn't have it quite finished.
Topolsky said, My hand, my eye reacts instinctively, selectively. When I move, I travel through everything. A piece of paper accepts and collects all visual images. Felix Topolsky was born in Warsaw on the 14th of August 1907. His father Edward was an actor and his mother Stanisława came from the Dutowski family in Łódź. After completing his secondary education, in 1926 he began to study at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw in the studio of Professor Tadeusz Pruszkowski. He belonged to the Free Painters Lodge, organized by Pruszkowski students. In 1932 and 34, they had exhibitions at the Institute of the Propaganda of Arts and in Czesław Gerlinski's Salon. In 1933, at the second exhibition of fine arts in Kazimierz on the Vistula River. He was also a cadet in the school of the officers of the artillery reserve. His professional career started with the barber of Warsaw, Cyrulik Warszawski, where he published in 1928 to 34. In 1934, he illustrated Julian Tubin's Polish Drinking Dictionary and Bacchic Anthology. In 1935, the Barber of Warsaw sent him to London to relate the coronation ceremony of George V, and he stayed there for good. Soon he began to cooperate with a lot of prestigious magazines of Great Britain, America and Asia, among others with Vogue, Life, the Illustrated London News, The Observer, Harper's Bazaar, Look, The News Chronicle, The Picture Post, The New Statesman, and The Hindustan Times. He made friends with George Bernard Shaw and illustrated three of his books, in 1939, Geneva, and In Good King Charles's Golden Days, and in 1940, Pygmalion. The writer and Felix Topolsky soon became friends. Daniel writes about his father. Although he settled down in London in 1935 and married Marion Everall, an actress, his deep need for travelling led him to nearly every corner of the earth. He experienced and sketched war with all its terror and upheaval. He drew changing events, national customs, clothing and daily life of various people. He appreciated the uniqueness of the British. It is like emerging from the uniformity of Central Europe and diving into the unusual, he observed from his favourite position of outsider. Marion Everall, born in Wolverhampton in Central England, came to London at the beginning of the 30s. She was famous for her radical leftist ideas and anti-fascist slogans which she voiced all over the city. She rode in London on her motorcycle. She met Felix when they worked for the film producer Alexander Court. She was a popular and influential person and thanks to her Felix met a lot of important people from the world of art, politics and business. After the Second World War, when their children, Teresa and Daniel, were born, Marion devoted herself to bringing them up. After divorcing Felix, she moved to the family house in Regent's Park, where she died in 1985. The second wife of Felix was Carol Stanley, an architect who worked as a conservationist in the Victorian Albert Museum. They lived in Whitehall in London until Felix died. Already in 1937, he represented British art at the International Art Exhibition in Paris. In 1940, he represented Polish art in Brighton, Manchester and Northampton, and in 1942 in Ottawa, Canada. In the Second World War, he was an officer in the Polish army and was the only one from all Polish soldiers to receive the title of war artist from the British Queen. He made thousands of sketches, sailed in one of the first convoys to Murmansk, witnessed the Battle of Britain, documented fighting in the Middle and Far East, in Africa, in Italy, and also stayed in occupied Germany. His graphics were made into albums, Britain and War and Peace, and Three Continents, 1944 to 1945. On all fronts of war, 
było nie tylko geograficzne, ale też włączyło się w objechanie historii naszego czasu. During the war, Topolsky made acquaintance with Prince Philip, which turned out to be important in his future life. Thanks to the personal support of the prince, Topolsky received a location for his atelier, under the Hungerford Bridge. The prince also bought a lot of his works. In 1947, Topolsky became a British citizen. Here we are in my father's studio, which was the second studio he had in London. We are in the centre of London, on the South Bank. And um, this is where he worked and entertained since 1951. So he was here for 50, for 50 years. And um, this is the day when he had open house. And he would always have visitors coming roughly from 5 o'clock till 8 o'clock. And they would be from all walks of life, including a lot of Polish students who used to come round, including Polanski, including Skolimowski including Andrzej Wajda, so there were a lot of Polish people he knew. We also went back to Poland with him the first time in 1961 and loved Poland. And uh, he considered himself a citizen of the world, so he traveled all over the world and did paintings and portraits of everybody, which hopefully, hopefully you will get, get to, to see. see. It's not the place it was when he was alive because um, he animated it and without Felix the studio does not really have the central point that made it such a fascinating place to all of the people who came here. A great many Polish um, people came here um, I'm trying to think of their names um, Prince Radziwill came here uh, on one occasion, and Count Zamoyski, and um, but Felix, of course, was was well known to the whole Polish community, both in London and abroad. Uh, I miss Felix terribly reclining here on his fantastic king bed, full of uh, different furs and looking terribly glamorous, having uh, people coming and talking, masses of different uh, young and older people. Um, uh, privately was very kind and uh, affectionate. Um, never uh, forget uh, the, the stories I will tell him, always give me some very wise advice, which sometimes now I'm uh, upset I'm not, uh, uh, I haven't taken them all uh, seriously. Uh, even when I opened, picking the whole gallery, he was so kind and uh, um, make a painting for me as a sow. <laughs> I brought it here to show you, um, uh, and always said, "Man, can remember, don't bring me here any idiots and no children unless they finish 16." <laughs> um, I would say uh, two stories about uh, my father, which are uh, perhaps um, they give an idea of his the way he would work. Um, uh, Firstly, we were, uh, there was a small film being made uh, for television for the BBC uh, about my rowing and they asked if uh, perhaps uh, they could film my father in his workplace painting the memoir of the century which is his huge 600 feet long, 200 meter long painting of the 20th century. And it's a wonderful uh, um, uh, expression of the history of the century. And um, they came into the, uh, the, the film crew, came to the, uh, to the memoir, and Felix was going to paint 
Martin Luther King in one section of the, uh, of the, uh, the memoir. And uh, they were setting themselves up and getting ready a little bit and they said, why don't you climb on your ladder and, and start to paint Martin Luther King and then we'll get rolling with the film and we'll pick you up while you're filming this, uh, while, while you're painting the picture. And he said, listen, I will uh, get up on my little ladder when you are ready to film. And the producer said, uh, <laughs> very funny, but please um, just start painting. He said, no, I'm serious because I will not do this painting twice. And they were very uh, uh, anxious about this, but they started to get their, uh, their filming together and they were set up and finally Felix said, uh, are you rolling? Is it ready? So the uh, producer said, okay, rolling. So Felix said, so you're filming now? And he said, uh, they said yes. So he climbed up the ladder and he painted Martin Luther King from memory. He'd done many drawings of him before. He painted Martin Luther King from memory onto this canvas in two minutes. And then he finished, climbed down the steps and the producer was saying, oh God, did you get it? Did you get it? This was uh, very, <laughs> it was much too quick and uh, it shows how fast Felix could work. Um, I met Felix in 1958 when I was a nightclub photographer and he was always always very interested in that kind of life uh, because he admired the drawings of Hogarth and Konstantin Guy and other people who had filmed what the Japanese call the floating world uh, who had drawn, I should say. And um, so he asked me to come to the studio and to do some work for him. And at the same time, he received the commission from Prince Philip to uh, do the 100-foot mural in Buckingham Palace. And he asked me to document it from the beginning. So uh, when the panels were erected inside the studio, and before there were any marks placed on them by his hand, I began to photograph the um, setup in the studio. And as he filled in the designs on the 14 panels, I continued to photograph until the work was complete and went to Buckingham Palace. And then I followed him to the palace and photographed the work there in 1960. And again in 19. 77 for the book um, Topolsky's Buckingham Palace Panoramas uh, which um, uh, was a large uh, art book um, containing photographs of the whole uh, 30 meter um, spread of the panoramas. When I first came to England uh, which was uh, uh, this was happening in 1966 a swing in London, I was invited to uh, Felix's uh, um, studio in here and, uh, and I was just amazed because uh, I used to follow and I used to know his work um, as a student of Academy of Arts in Warsaw and I was really proud that uh, eventually I managed to meet this grand, grand man who whom work I really like very, very much. I was standing next to him and he kind of grumpily said to me, do sit down, young man. I don't like when tall people standing next to me, he said. So that's a little story of a big, big man. Uh, I, I love uh, to, to, to think uh, he is one of these uh, great Poles who managed to be grant in Poland and he managed to be grant abroad. Um, I'm very pleased also to get involved in some work uh, with Tess and Daniel and I'm very pleased to be here. From the moment I walked into Felix's house um, all those years ago when I came as somebody who wanted to commission work from Felix for a magazine uh, that I was working on, I knew that I wanted him in my life forever. It was a day when I not only met him, but I met Teresa when she was a very young girl. And they did become part of my life forever. 
If I think of one word to apply to Felix, it is that he was an extraordinary connector. He connected to everybody. And that's what makes his work so remarkable, because he connected seeing the truth of every situation and everybody. So his work became very vigorous, very important, and very long-lasting. And you can pick up work that he's done in Africa, you can pick up work that he's done in America, in Europe, wherever, wherever he traveled, and you sense that connection to the people he drew and the places he drew. He was a rich man inside. I mean, he really, as somebody has said, he really listened, and he talked wonderfully. And I can remember clearly, I don't know if I can repeat it, but the way he would greet me and he would say, as I came in from a long trip, he would say, hello, Fran. I mean, he just enveloped you with his affection for you, if he had affection for you, and you knew that you were at home. He made you feel that you had reached a place that was home. I miss him very much. Uh, and he was very, very vivid as a person. And um, always found him to be a very helpful uh, and considerate person. He was particularly helpful with young people and uh, when artists brought work to him for evaluation he never said anything unkind about it even if the work was no good he would try to find something um, upon in the work on which he could make um, a um, an encouraging comment every friday uh, people came to the studio particularly pretty women because they were very fond of him and they would bring him flowers and cakes. He wasn't supposed to eat the cakes because he, he was diabetic, uh, but he would allow them to put a few pieces of cream cake uh, uh, into his mouth from time to time. He spent a lot of his um, later years lying down on the couch, which you see behind uh, me, and um, surrounded by beautiful women. And um, we were very close. I was his only daughter. And um, he called me, which was a very strange phrase, his best friend. So um, uh, we were sort of um, pals. And um, I worked closely with him. My mother worked closely with him. And uh, he was a fantastic companion and friend, as well as a father. He was a great talker, as well as a very great listener and I used to have this terrible habit of always interrupting his conversation and he always used to say, let me finish, let me finish. This is a terrible anecdote. <laughs> Felix Ador to come to Polish uh, celebration party to my house and always said, we have to write about your fantastic food and fantastic party in a newspaper. <laughs> and I always uh, was amazed about a Polish custom for Easter and uh, so it was a great fun and now it's a little bit uh, sad the last time I saw him here uh, it was Friday I think it was a lot of people and uh, I, I didn't want to take his attention because other people wanted to talk to him Therefore, I was sitting, talking to someone else, and he came very angry, said, you came here to talk to me. You have to talk to me now. And it was the last time I talked to him. He was very debonair and handsome and um, full of uh, European charm when I first met him. Uh, and then he was about, I think, 45. Um, as he grew older, he naturally grew smaller um, because the bones contract with age. And um, in his last years, he was unable to paint without holding his hand like that. So he would hold the brush in his hand and hold um, the brush hand with his other hand so that he could make the painting. Have you filmed his palette? Um, which is so heavily coated with paint, 
It's quite obvious that Felix uh, did not economize on paint when you look at the palette. It, he, he just added more and more and more paint uh, until the, the palette collapsed uh, under the weight of the very expensive uh, oil paint. But I think that's an indication of the kind of person he was. He didn't count the cost either in materials or energy or time. And uh, for me, when I was working with Felix, uh, when we were traveling together in South America, uh, the same thing was happening. I would drive down a street very slowly in a Land Rover. We were driving in a Land Rover. And he would sit next to me, and he would be drawing. And we would drive slowly down the street, and by the end of the street, the whole action of this street was there on the page. Extraordinary. Done not even looking at the page. He knew where the page was, he knew where the lines were, and he was looking at what was happening, and a photographer would get one image. Felix got the whole street, everything happening in that street, somebody being arrested by the police, somebody else being uh, some, a, a woman in the market there, some children playing football, all of it would be there, done in the picture. It was an extraordinary facility, an extraordinary ability. And uh, for me, this was very exciting, traveling through South America. Uh, we were traveling in South America to write a book about a journey around South America and a journey around us, each other, to do photographs and drawings. He was going to do many drawings. We would have an exhibition when we came home, publish a book, and also have a television documentary about the journey. So this was a very big project. He was 75 years old, I was 35 years old. It was a wonderful thing to be able to do, to travel together like this. He had never been to South America, he'd been everywhere else in the world. I had been to South America before, I wanted to show him South America. So, we went off to do this journey together for six months. And his best friend, an artist, uh, um, who was a, a Polish artist that he'd been many, many uh, years of, uh, friends with, had said, please don't go, Felix, Daniel is trying to kill you. And uh, Felix said, I'm going, he is my son, we are going to do this project together. And so we went and we did this fantastic journey for six months, everywhere in South America, uh, traveling on the Altiplano in the north of America. We did a book which uh, was translated into Polish called Travels with, my, uh, Travels with My Father. And this book was translated into Polish and published by uh, Iskri in, in Poland. And there was one moment in this book and also in the documentary which uh, I found very moving. We were sitting discussing uh, this journey together and Felix had said that always he had felt in competition with his son, with me. Uh, that we were in competition uh, uh, in, in, every, uh, in every way, with, uh, in work, in, uh, with women, with, uh, in any possible way. But here now in South America, where he had become quite injured with his foot, he couldn't walk very well, and he was having to lean on me when we were going through the jungle or climbing a mountain, he would have to be relying on me. And, um, he said that this was for him a very uh, comforting feeling to be able to rely now on his son in his old age uh, that his son would help him to make these uh, these uh, journeys to help him uh, in his old age and he found that very comforting and it was a burden taken from his shoulders of having to compete now he could rest happy within the bosom of his son and so this was a very calming, very thoughtful moment for him and for both of us. But of course when we got back to London again and he was back with his friends, he was competitive again exactly as he'd always been. So these are some impressions of my father. There are quite a lot of anecdotes about Felix, but um, most of them are of a private nature. He would very often say things um, when I was working here with him in a very quiet way, almost under his voice, as if he was speaking to himself and not to me. And it would be indiscreet to speak about certain moments um, on film. But like all artists, he was multifaceted and he had um, his private and his uh, public persona. One of the interesting things about Felix was 
that he always um, pretended to be less acute than he really was. Um, for example, uh, when he looked at people, uh, in my experience, his eyes were usually slightly hooded. Um, but when he was drawing people, his eyes would become wide open and he would um, show what... Shall we wait for the train to pass? He would show what the uh, Picasso's biographer has called the mirada fuerte, the strong look of the artist who seizes um, the sitter uh, in his gaze. Um, an act of conquest. But you only saw that look on Felix's face uh, when he was drawing. And a couple of times when I photographed him and he was getting impatient with me. Daniel recollects, the creative process of Topolsky's is not peaceful or quiet. He doesn't create mirror-like reflections. It is rather a subtle and slightly satirical searching for one's soul, which miraculously emerges from among energetic, expressive lines. Topolsky hated stereotypes and never wanted to be put into any categories. His activities was immediate and fluid-like in its character. He worked quickly, rarely looking at the paper while sketching, instinctively presenting a scene which he had in his mind. With his professional eye and quick hand, Topolsky made perhaps the fullest and the most intelligent visual presentation of the important epoch. The Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw's reference to him as the amazing graphic artist, perhaps the greatest impressions of the black and white, as well as his curiosity and ability to penetrate various social groups assured for him the position of a person who was at the right place at the right time. No one else could or would do it better, not a photographer or a director, a writer or any other artist. Topolsky's sketches present history as it was and how it was. He travelled with Nehru, with Gandhi before India became independent, he joined the first papal visit to the Holy Land and the Queen's visit to North America. He came in contact with the Black Panther organization in California, with the hippies and the punks in the 60s and the 80s in London, and he observed the protests of the Democrats in Chicago in 1968 and the activities of the United Nations. His instinct led him to the places and the times of all great political changes. He was in Northern Ireland, Vietnam, China in the 30s, and in times of the Cultural Revolution, he observed the apartheid in South Africa and the dictatorships in South America. Felix Topolsky is the author of The Diary of the Century, the monumental painting under the arches of the Hungerford Bridge. The diary reflects the greatest political and artistic events of the 20th century. In fact, Topolsky had painted murals while still in Poland. In the Institute of the Propaganda of Art, he made a humorous painting. Próbuję tworzyć właśnie w sensie nie wykańczania, nie doprowadzania do kropki. Rzucam się po tym pamiętniku, kiedy go maluję. Wracam do wcześniejszych punktów, dodaję później i zawsze z tym poczuciem, że to nigdy nie jest skończone w żadnym punkcie. A tym bardziej odrzucam koncept zakończenia tego pamiętnika. Daniel writes about the diary. In the last 14 years of his life, he transformed all his life experience onto the monumental 200 meter long, 7 meter high painting called The Diary of the Century. He applied graphics as a tool for his epic, unique artistic impression, but his great travel throughout the world. It is a kind of a visual diary, a bent, twisted carton wall of all unforgotten thoughts. 
It reminds one of a serpentine hung above the two arches of the Hungerford Bridge in London, situated opposite the Houses of Parliament, accessible to the public. It is the Sistine Chapel of Topolsky's, the resume of his life. I nazywam to stuleciem, idzie z moim życiem i kontynuuje się i po prostu przerwie się naturą rzeczy, pędzel wypadnie mi z ręki i to będzie sztuczne, ale właśnie swego rodzaju zakończenie, ale nigdy zakończenie z mojego punktu widzenia. In 1961, the artist presented his works at the National Museum in Warsaw. Thirteen years later, on the 6th of December, he received the honorary doctorate degree from the Jagiellonian University as a symbol of the appreciation of his art and its humanistic value. Before him, only one artist had been honored in this way, Jan Mateko. Felix Topolsky also made the scenography to the plays of George Bernard Shaw, Ionesco, Duncan, Ustinov and Gogol, and cooperated with British and American TV. Jakiegoś kierunku, jakiegoś potwierdzenia, jakiejś tezy, jakiegoś dogmatu. Odwrotnie, idę instynktem poprzez życie, ale życie doczesne dla mnie jest fantastycznym cudem. The greatest impressionist of the black and white died in London in 1989.